Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? Today, we are going to talk about black women's clubs around the turn of the century. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a conversation that I had with Professor Melissa Blair. Okay, great. Let's get into this. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 34, Burned Records and Black Women's Clubs. I mean, these are big topics. These are big (laughs) topics. Had you heard of um, Black Women's Clubs before? Do you mean... Like, at colleges, or? (laughs) No, they're, like, um, these, like, social clubs that were created that were specific for black women uh, around the turn of the century because they were being excluded from white women's clubs. No, I mean, I love that they exist. This is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But a lot of these clubs around the turn of the century became basically all the other issues that women's clubs were working on, like temperance and women's yep. suffrage, like they became the black women's version of those clubs in a lot of ways. And I am ashamed to say that I only recently learned about them. And yet again, I teach high school <laughs> history. <laughs> well, you know, I never know what's going on. So <laughs> <laughs> you but it's got, such you got one up on me. But it is. It's like, why haven't we heard about them? So so you talked to this professor about these clubs. Yeah, and, and she's okay. amazing. Um, Melissa Blair, she's a professor at Auburn University down in Alabama. And I was really grateful to talk to her because um, a lot of our guests are from the Northeast. And it was really this nice. This true. We to do like, have a lot of Northerners on, and Yankees on our, our podcast. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm excited. We have some, um, diverse professors coming on in the next few weeks. So it's, it's really cool. Um, and she was just a wealth of knowledge. I just felt so lucky to be able to sit down and talk with her. So, um, let me let her introduce herself. Here she is. Um, so my name is Melissa Blair. I'm an associate professor of history and an affiliate faculty member with the women and gender studies program at Auburn university. Um, I've been at Auburn for six years. Um, Before that, I taught for six years. This is how long I live in places. Um, I taught at a very small liberal arts college um, in Asheville, North Carolina, called Warren Wilson College. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Virginia and my bachelor's degree in history from the University of Kentucky, which is where I'm from. Um, So I stayed home for for college. My main area of my own research is women and politics in the US in the 20th century. Um, So my first book was about grassroots feminism. Um, It's called Revolutionizing Expectations, um, which the title comes from a goal that the YWCA set as one of their three year goals in 1970. They declared one of their goals was to revolutionize society's expectations of women in three years, modest goal. Um, <laughs> so it looks at the role of, of pre-existing women's organizations, of women's clubs like the YWCA and the League of Women Voters, um, National Council of Jewish Women, National Council of Negro Women, the role of groups like that in the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s. Um, so that's what the first book was about. Um, that was my dissertation and then became the first book. The book that I'm working on now is called How Women Win. And it's a group biography of five women who were the director of directors of the women's division of either the DNC or the RNC from the 1930s through the 1950s. So basically there are these women that were at the center of the campaigns that elected FDR and Eisenhower and nobody's ever heard of them. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Um, my agent will fuss at me if I give away much more than that. Um, but that's what I'm working on right now for the second book. And so I'm on sabbatical right now, actually. Um, and hopefully we'll be on sabbatical for the fall also. And hopefully that book will be out late 2022 is what we're sort of hoping for. Um, 
so yeah, that's, and then here at Auburn, I teach, I'm the U.S. Women's Historian uh, in the History Department, so I teach the whole of U.S. Women's History um, from uh, pre-contact Native American women up through as far as I can get. Um, I try to like, I, I, I've yet to make it much past the early 80s in any sustained way, trying to do all of women's history in one semester in 15 weeks. Um, but, um, and then I also teach upper level classes on the history of sexuality. Um, on, I'm gonna do, do one on women in politics uh, here probably next year. Um, and, our, and I teach in our graduate program as well and teach women and gender classes there also. So, Brooke, she is obviously just brilliant, and I'm so excited to read her book when it comes out. Oh, my goodness. It sounds amazing. It sounds like she's published some pretty incredible works, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, It was interesting, though, listening to her talk about her uh, expertise and her experience, and I... I thought it was interesting that she um, is this women's history professor in the history department. And I was curious if that was a common thing across the country. Like, do do most, because the college I went to didn't have that. So I was just curious. And um, this is what she said. So it's less common now than it was probably 10, 15 years ago, because I think fewer, not by a ton, but I think fewer departments have, a per, history departments have a person like me, have a dedicated women's historian. Um, a lot of places, a lot of places hired one, like when the field was created, basically in the 70s and 80s. And then as those women have retired, not every place has replaced them. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it's certainly at Warren Wilson, I was also affiliated faculty with with women's studies there. And actually my women's history class there was required um, for the women's studies minor um, at Wilson. Um, Here it's one of a a group of electives that you can choose from. Um, And that's, I mean, and and any women's studies program has, has that, has affiliate faculty in history, in English, in sociology, you know, people who sort of how they approach their questions are housed in a different discipline, right? Like I'm a historian first, for sure. Um, I am not a gender studies person by training. Um, I'm very much a historian, but I, I think about gender, I work on gender, you know, and so um, so it makes sense for me to be sort of part of the team because because no place has like, no place, maybe two or three schools have like a women's studies program that's actually full of people whose tenure line is in women's studies. Like that's just not, that's never been the model for, for really for women's studies or for African-American studies. Um, they're, they're designed to be interdisciplinary programs. So then I asked her, um, where, you know, you're talking about black women's clubs, obviously they are an important part of history and an important part of the black experience in women's suffrage organizations and temperance organizations. So I asked her where she started when she's talking about this history, where do you go with your students and take me there. And so this is what she said. Yeah. So I think the place that you start is in Reconstruction and in the Black Church. Um, Also, to tie into the election, we get, we're close enough to the Georgia border that some of our TV stations come from Georgia, so we were getting all of the campaign ads during the Georgia runoff, Um, and so, um, yeah, so Warnock, you know, really being this emblem of the Black Church um, that has now been sent to Congress, which is amazing, Um, and so they start, women start, Black women start organizing even before Reconstruction, if we're in the North, um, organizing within their churches in much the same way white women did. They would raise money in what were called tract societies that were basically groups that raised money to to send Bibles out to people. Um, They would organize and raise money for missions. In the 19th century, that's mostly domestic missions, like just going in, you know, to the if we're talking about Northern women in the say 1840s, 1850s, you know, sending missionaries out to wild places like Illinois, um, you know, and and stuff like that. Um, And then after reconstruction, you know, as formerly enslaved women now get to choose where they go to church, um, they form their own churches and form these women's women's groups within the churches pretty quickly. Um, And, What they learn there is, and what women's clubs always gave to all women, white or black, was a space where they could really learn and hone skills that they could then take 
to other kinds of work, whether it's fundraising or research or public speaking, like what there's this sort of body of skills that these women's clubs are really important in developing. And so from the church where I'm, I'm mostly gonna focus on the sort of secular ones, um, from there, again, for both white and black women, the next stop is temperance. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union is founded in 1874 in Ohio. And it's always open to black women, but they're not always treated great. The chapters are usually segregated even in the North. Um, and so the story that I want to start with, I'm historians are all storytellers that just, and you know, many of us are, <laughs> many of us like me were theater geeks in high school and are like, oh wait, I can tell the stories and do the history. And there we go. Um, and so we're storytellers. I have um, a theater minor, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of us. <laughs> it's like, wait, a way to tell the stories and kind of pay the bills. Okay. <laughs> but um, so the story I want to tell, and I'm, I want to give credit to the people whose research I'm leaning on here. So this is coming out of Glenda Gilmore's first book called Gender and Jim Crow, um, which was published in the late 1990s. Um, and she's focused really on North Carolina and North Carolina in the 1880s is developing a very robust women's Christian temperance union. There are chapters all over the, all over the state um, and there are segregated chapters for black women, but how the white women in North Carolina organized it was that, so a local chapter, say the Charlotte chapter, the Charlotte chapter reports to the state office and then reports to the national office. Well, the black women had to report to the, the black women in Charlotte had to report to the white women in Charlotte and therefore like sort of never got in anything that went up the chain, right? Never, are never talked about in the state reports or never talked about in the national reports. So in the late 1880s, um, a woman, and I'm going to grab the book because I'm going to forget her name, but I have the book right here. Hang on. Yes. So it's a woman named Sarah Jane Woodson Early. Um, she decides in 1889 that the African-American women in North Carolina have had enough of this. Um, she's got some great quotes about like, if we are all good Christian temperance women, then why can we not talk directly to the national office. And so the black women of the WCTU in North Carolina break away from the white chapters, form an alternative organization called the WCTU number two and start sending their reports directly to the national office, completely bypassing the white supremacist white structure at the state level. Um, by the end of the 19th century, there are five Southern states that have WCTU number twos that have just black statewide coalitions um, of suffer of uh, temperance women, black temperance women. Suffrage and temperance are always a little bit of uncomfortable bedfellows. It's not nearly as close of a relationship as abolition and suffrage was yeah. um, in the in the antebellum period. So, for example, the woman who's the president of the WCTU. For from 1876 until her death, right at the end of the century, is a woman named Frances Willard. Mm -hmm. um, and and Willard is super cool. She's a as out of a lesbian as you could be in the 19th century. Like she had a partner, and people knew this and talked about it. Um, and her motto for the WCTU was "Do everything." And so the WCTU has all of these departments. They're one of the first groups that works on animal cruelty in the United States, for example. Um, and they work on public works projects and they do all this other stuff um, in the 1880s and 1890s, but they don't do suffrage as a group. Hmm. Willard herself is a suffragist. She supports women's rights to vote, but she knows that that is so controversial that if the organization were to endorse it, it would create, in her mind, sort of more problems than it was worth for the organization. Um, so where the link for, for Black women, where the organizational link between suffrage and clubs is closer is in the group that sort of comes after the WCTU. So in 1896, um, there's a new group that's founded called the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, or the NACW. 
um, which is what I'm going to call it because National Association of Colored Women's Clubs is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, so the NACW is formed to sort of create a national organization for all of these women's clubs that have been meeting all over the country with names like, um, there's one that I found the records for and got to read the records for um, both in Denver and in Indianapolis when I was working on my first book, um, both of which were called, the one in Indianapolis was called the Fortnightly Club. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of the one in Denver, um, but, uh, or like they'd have names like the Lily Pond Club, the Tuesday Club. And all of these groups, again, and, and there are equivalent white women's organizations of these as well. They did a variety of things. Some of them were garden clubs, some of them were study clubs. Um, the Fortnightly Club in Indianapolis is really cool because it's basically just a book club. Um, and when I was reading their records in the 1960s and 1970s, it's this group of like little old black ladies who have been in this club for decades who are like reading James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni in the 70s. I'm like, y'all are amazing. <laughs> I want to hang out with you. Um, but the NACW always had sort of an extra layer. So that part of it's very similar with what white women's clubs are doing. The NACW had really two more things that it did. One to your question is that it was overtly a suffrage organization. Um, and because black women are largely kept out of NASA, out of the, the North American Women's uh, Suffrage, National American Women's Suffrage Association, the main suffrage group, because black women are pretty much shut out of NASA, um, the NACW had its own suffrage department and hired actually a woman who was a professor at Tuskegee, um, which for nobody, you and nobody else listening knows Alabama geography. I didn't know this till I got here, but Tuskegee is the next county over from Auburn. So it's just about half an hour down the road for me. Um, so a woman who was a professor at Tuskegee named Adela Hunt Logan. Um, and she travels the country from 1905 until she becomes ill in 1914 as the main national suffrage organizer for the NACW. And she teaches uh, black women all over the country how to lobby state legislators, you know, how to pitch suffrage. Um, she has these great quotes about how, you know, if white women need the vote that right protective of all other rights, how much more do black women need it? Basically, and and so, and that's really where, that's why the NACW supports suffrage, right? That's why um, Black women in general support suffrage is because they believe that having the vote will enable them to try to at least ameliorate some of the worst abuses of Jim Crow. Um, and it's funny, since we just finished the suffrage centennial, I gave a lot of talks over the past year about suffrage and especially living in Alabama, um, I had a couple places that asked me to talk about Southern suffrage. And I basically got up there and said, if you wanna look at Southern suffrage before about 1912, 1915, you have to look at black women. There are almost no organized white Southern women doing suffrage until the last decade of the suffrage fight. But there are always black women there. There's a pair of sisters that addresses the South Carolina state legislature in 1869 um, black women on and give a speech on behalf of women's suffrage. So that's so the NACW is the main suffrage organization for um, for black women. I'm a little concerned this Adela Hunt Logan. I have never heard her name before. And I had never I had never heard of her until like two years after I moved here. Yeah, that's wild. I'm her, so excited to look her, her up and learn her more. Granddaughter. Um, whose name is Adele Logan Alexander, is a historian, and just last year published a biography of her that's the first book-length study of her. Um, and she had a very, she had a very tragic life. I said she became ill in 1914. It was, she struggled with mental illness um, and actually took her own life in 1915. Um, but she was friends with um, Margaret Murray Washington, who's Booker T. Washington's wife, um, all of the sort of, yeah, all of the movies. Well, I was expecting you to mention someone yeah. like her. Like, I was like, oh, they hired, you know, Mrs. Washington. Right. Or, you know. Know, and Mrs. Washington is very involved in suffrage. Like the Tuskegee suffrage, women's suffrage group was active. And Margaret Murray Washington is absolutely one of the driving forces there. Um, but Logan is the one, Washington was kind of like being the first lady of Tuskegee was, a, yeah, that she had to stay close to home. Um, to do that. And so Logan is the one who sort of travels, um, travels all over. 
And other, I mean, and other very, you know, obviously the leaders in the NACW, women like uh, Mary Church Terrell, Anna Julia Cooper, you know, women like that are out there giving, you know, giving pro-suffrage speeches all the time. Um, Terrell was actually friends with Susan B. Anthony and, and hoped to make NASA a more sort of welcoming space to Black women. And it, Anthony knew that if suffrage was going to pass through a constitutional amendment, at least some Southern states would have to ratify it. And she prioritized that basically over bringing black women in. So she brought up Mary Church Terrell, and she is a powerhouse black woman in this time period. And one thing that I have found interesting about her is just that she stays in NASA despite some of the frustrating things that black women yeah. are experiencing there. And um, it raised the same question that we asked Tina Cassidy before about Alice Paul, which is just... Is Susan B. Anthony, like, was she racist? And um, and what do we need to do to recognize the incredible accomplishments that Susan B. Anthony, you know, like, and probably like with any complicated historical figure, like Thomas Jefferson comes to mind, right? He's a great yeah. man who owns slaves. Like, what do you do with that information? Um, what do you, and, and so would you, I asked her, because... You know, Susan B. Anthony's parents were, and, and she was an abolitionist. She was right. very close friends with Frederick Douglass. Um, and I've heard that it's mostly Elizabeth Cady Stanton that is the more, like, kind of outwardly maybe more racist one. Um, and, you know, Susan. Well, when, we're, when we're using this, tell me, like, we know this from. So there are. Um, there are times, so, I mean, the thing that's really complicated about this, about talking about their racism is these women were abolitionists, right? Like they were yeah. working to end slavery and they were working for equality. But what was really frustrating for them was when the 15th Amendment gives the right to vote to black men, um, it... <sighs> They were frustrated because, I mean, these are some of the most educated women in the world and and literally, and I say in the world because educated people in the world, I, I, I might even put them above men because they literally have nothing to do, but because they read and educate. They're, <laughs> they're rich and they sit and they read. And so they are, in terms of a meritocracy, they are very frustrated because, you know, illiterate black men are getting the vote before them. And is that racist? It's definitely classist, and it's definitely those things. Elizabeth yeah. Cady Stanton goes so far as to say racist things and derogatory things. Susan B. Okay, Anthony... Okay, so we have evidence of that. Yeah. yeah. Susan B. Anthony is feeling hurt by her stature and her status in the approval process for voting. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, someone, I read an article recently where they talked a little bit about how there's a lot of talk in the last year with, you know, the climate of 2020 um, and then, of course, the centennial of suffrage. There's been a lot of conversations about we need to really point out the racism of some of these suffragists, and um, which I... I'm all about, like, if there's things to expose, let's talk about it. But this person was also talking about, but we can't take it out of context and not remember the sexism of the era that was saying that, like, a man's ability to represent his household is more important than a woman's ability to represent herself right. and, and, yeah. and her household, right? Like, we can't forget that there are many single women who are the poorest people in our country, the most vulnerable. And, um, and, you know, and so if we're going to talk about racism, she was, you know, advocating that we talk about sexism too. Let's, let's yeah. talk about that. Um, it's hard. It's hard when you see, and I imagine this has happened to other people in their lifetimes of seeing a hero taken down, um, because of things that have come to light. And so I, I, I don't know. I don't well, know that you can so like, put Susan B. Anthony in the same bucket as, you know, Kelly Stanton and, like, really say that they're even remotely close. It's, 
she was frustrated with the circumstance of her status. Right. But they're best friends. They're working together. And right. did Susan B. Ant- like, okay, she, maybe she wasn't racist, but was she anti-racist? You know, like, so that's... Yeah. Enough. Yeah. So I have been shocked at how little I know. And so I <laughs> really wanted to talk to an expert and ask her, like, what do you think about this? Yeah. Oh, so I'm too. this is what she said. Susan B. Anthony and Alice Paul are like two of my favorite people of all time. So I really struggle when people say that they were racist. And I don't know if that's me not being a good anti-racist or if that's me seeing their pragmatism. And I'm just curious what you think about that. With Anthony, and I don't know Paul as like, I don't know as much about this for Paul. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I take that back. Yes, I do. Um, with <laughs> you probably know more than most. I was like, actually, no, I do. I have to think like more, Paul shows her colors on this a lot more post-suffrage with what the National Women's Party does in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and... So Anthony, let's put, let's put it this way. Of Stanton, Anthony, and Paul, Anthony is the least racist of the three. Like, it is, it is, I mean, K- Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like, she, they were at the abolitionist thing because her husband wanted to be there. She is never active in abolition. Mm. And she's always, even in the 1860s, saying very elitist things about, like, educated suffrage. And isn't it terrible that white, educated white women are not getting the vote and these immigrant men and black men are? Elizabeth Cady Stanton says stuff like that all the time. Yeah. Um, Alice Paul, especially again, after suffrage, um, it becomes very clear, like there's a great, this is another thing I use when I when I gave some talks, they're, the, they're getting letters. The National Women's Party is getting letters from black women in the South saying, we can't register to vote. Can you please help us? And the National Women's Party writes back and says, you're being discriminated because of your race and not your sex. So no, we can't help you. Like just straight up refuse to do anything. Um, and, and like Paul and the National Women's Party's pursuit of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1920s was something that the reason so many women come out against that is because they say, yes, this sounds good in principle, but it will do material harm to all of these working class women who are currently having their workplaces regulated by protective labor laws that only apply to women. And so if you pass the ERA, you're gonna take away the tiny slivers of, you know, of safety measures. I mean, this is pre-New Deal. Mm-hmm. So there's no national unemployment insurance, there's no workers' comp, there's none of that, like these yeah are the only tiny shreds of a safety net under these women and they're like you would throw all of that out and Alice Paul is like yes Mm -hmm. (laughs) discriminatory um so but with Anthony it is so there's a great book that you should read called The Myth of Seneca Falls I've seen I that one it's on my (laughs) my friend Lisa who wrote that book is on the was in the PBS stuff um and, and I'll go ahead and sort of spoil the big reveal at the end just for you, and they can edit this out if they want to. Um, so Stan, there's this four-volume history of women's suffrage that Stanton and Anthony work on. It's this amazing thing because it's both a narrative history and an archive. They reproduce a ton of primary sources in the published volume. And then the League of Women Voters does two more. NASA does a volume that does like after Anthony's death through 1920, and then the League of Women Voters sort of wraps it up. So it's a total of six volumes, but Anthony has direct supervision over the first four. After the fourth one is published, right before she dies in 1902, she and her secretary take all, take the entire archive that they used to write this book out in the backyard of Anthony's house and set it on fire. And so, because she wanted, this is Lisa's argument in the book, is it's control of the narrative, right? That control of the narrative gives you power. And so the reason we don't know it, what the reason you don't know about Adela Hunt Logan is because until 20 years ago, that book was the source for 95% of the suffrage history that was out there. And those black women are not in that book, which makes it look like they weren't there at all. Fascinating. 
I didn't know the part about them burning it. They said it, yeah. My grad students lose their mind every year because they're training to be historians. So they're like, they're burning this stuff. I'm like, I know. I always sort of preface it. I'm like, if y'all like Susan B. Anthony, you're not going to like her after you read this book. <laughs> so I don't know what to say. <laughs> like, I knew that they wrote that book and I knew that it was sort of like self- yeah, self-promoting. And and Lisa has brilliant arguments in there about like why they feel like they have to do that. Mm-hmm. Like that they sort of feel like in especially the 1870s and 1880s, when mem- when the lost cause is being born and we're debating over memories and legacies, and that's what history is, that they have to get themselves into that kind of because also she points out why it's called the myth of Seneca Falls, is if you asked anybody, even, you know even into the 1870s, when did the women's rights movement start? If they come up with a date, which they typically don't, they typically come up with this meeting in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850, which was a much larger meeting than the Seneca Falls meeting. Um, actually had a national audience and was like a was like a big, was billed as like a national women's rights conference. Whereas Seneca Falls is really basically, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton being like, hey, we should work on this. Can y'all come to me? Cause I've got like eight kids. And so I can't really go to you. Um, And, you know, and Anthony wasn't even there. Um, That's the other thing that she talks about a lot is how Anthony gets like superimposed back onto Seneca Falls when she wasn't there. Wait, Um, she wasn't there? She doesn't meet, she doesn't meet Stanton until 1850. Susan B. Anthony is not Seneca Falls. I thought she attended, but wasn't an organizer. Nope, not there, not there. Oh my God. My mind is blowing right now. <laughs> this is why I love what I do. I love these moments. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So let me push though, because I think the same questions could exist where she is now being a pragmatic historian or, and feel free to tell me that I'm just justifying my love for Susan B. Anthony, but she is seeing this need, she and Stanton, they burn these papers. Could you argue that that was just to find a place in history or is, is that a, was that intentionally racist to exclude? Cause no, they also exclude- I don't know. I don't think that's, yeah, exactly. I mean, like Victoria Woodhull's hardly in the thing. Like all the free love folks in the 18, no, they're not there at all. There's a whole bunch of, it's not just black women that are left out. It's basically anybody. And really like Lucy Stone's hardly in there. It's really anybody who didn't agree with their flavor of suffrage gets left out. So everybody like Lucy Stone that advocates for a state by state approach, um, you know, there's, yeah, Lucy Stone shows up in a brief mention because she organizes that 1850 conference in Worcester. Um, so she shows up then and then she is gone for the whole rest of the book. And they they had a very, very bitter falling out, um, Stanton and Anthony and Stone did in the late 1860s. Um, so I, I mean, it's, it's definitely like that she thinks both of them think to their dying day that the way that they are doing it is right. And also, and this is what's so brilliant about Lisa's book and also that telling the story of what they're doing is an important part of seeing the politics through to fruition. Mm. So that's absolutely what she thinks she's doing. I mean, and she's not, she's not a thousand percent wrong, right? Like it does, you know, Tennessee is the last state to ratify the 19th amendment, right? Like it is. And, and so that's why I said like, Anthony is, is the purest politician. And therefore I think the least racist of, I, I think I feel fairly comfortable saying that she's racist in the way that almost any white person in the, that grew up in the 1830s and forties was, um, but not, She's not saying the kinds of things and doing the kinds of things that Stanton that Stanton and Paul did. So wonderful answer. And okay, I have a bunch of things to think about related to to my my girl Susan. Um, but I didn't want to get too deep into Susan B. Anthony Land, and so yeah. I brought us back to these incredible Black women like Mary Church Terrell, who were doing an incredible job advocating yeah. for um, for Black women. And um, so let's take a little break, and when we come back, okay. we will talk about <laughs> these incredible Black women. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, go to our website, www.remedialherstory.com. 
You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Through Patreon, you can sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to behind-the-scenes information, gear, and bonus episodes. But more importantly, patrons are putting their money where their mouth is and making a financial commitment to getting women's history into the K-12 curriculum. We are so grateful to our patrons who sponsored this episode. Our history makers, Jeffrey. Our history heroes, Brooke and Barbara. Our historians, Jamie and Kent. And our allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah. Thank you. You guys make this show possible. Yeah, so I think, so Terrell is the founder of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, right? She's the first president, um, and she really sees this group as a way, and I we've been talking for like half an hour about Black women's clubs, and I have not used this phrase yet, what all of these clubs, whether we're talking Women's Christian Temperance Union or NACW clubs, all of these groups are part of what scholars, historians sort of loosely call the politics of respectability. Um, That term for historians actually is coined by Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham in her book about women in the black church um, in the, in the reconstruction era that's published in like the late 1980s. Um, It's a book called Righteous Discontent, which is a great name. Um, So these are all middle-class black women or fairly, or fairly comfortable black women in the case of someone like Terrell. Um, who are trying through all of this organizing, whether it's suffrage or not so much suffrage, sorry, whether it's temperance or the other stuff that I'm about to talk about that the, that the clubs did a lot, are trying to improve the treatment of African-Americans by sort of proving to white people that African-Americans are deserving of equal treatment are deserving of respect. And so it's sort of, you know, politics of respectability is this idea of like, if you behave even better than they do, then maybe they will treat us a little bit better. Um, And this is an idea that really grew a lot in the uh, historically black colleges, the HBCUs that are all founded in the 1870s and 1880s in cities that had large amounts of black businesses and black and a big black middle-class places like Tulsa or Durham, North Carolina. there's a book, a, a scholar has written a book uh, called Upbuilding Black Durham um, that's about, it's referred to as the cradle of the black middle class by the 1930s. It's got this huge number of black businesses. And she says that the, the middle class black women of Durham wielded respectability like a sword. Um, they just sort of, which I, I was writing about Durham for the first book and I found that quote, I was like using it because they're still doing it in the 60s. Um, uh, and so, it's really, that's really, it's, it has this class element to it, right? Because these are not working class women for the most part. Some of the temperance women are. Some of the temperance women, there's a bit more class diversity um, in the WCTU, but certainly the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs is an overwhelmingly middle class group. And so they're doing suffrage. They're doing all of the things that um, white women's clubs are doing, the sort of literary, you know, literary clubs and garden clubs and that kind of stuff. The other thing that NACW clubs are doing that's different from what white women are doing is they are also stepping into the breach and providing public services that towns and cities provide for their white residents that they do not provide for their black residents. So for example, in Atlanta, um, Tara Hunter talks about these groups in in her book, To Joy My Freedom. Um, There's uh, a lot of the faculty at the wives of the faculty at like Morehouse and Spelman and Atlanta University um, form these neighborhood clubs. And they're they're actually better than a lot of places about working with working class women. But one of the things they do is they do a lot of health clinics. They do a lot of vaccination work with kids. Um, They do a lot of um, other sorts of public health work. And that's very common um, throughout the country that you see black women's clubs setting up public health, you know, neighborhood health clinics Um, they lobby city governments to put playgrounds in black neighborhoods, to put sidewalks in black neighborhoods. Um, Sometimes they raise them, if the city refuses, sometimes they will raise the money themselves and open it themselves 
So these groups in Durham, actually in the mid 1920s, open a library, public library, that's open to the African-American population of Durham that was prohibited from using the public libraries in Durham. Um, and after it's up and running for a few years, they then, and this again was fairly common nationwide, you sort of raise the money, you get the thing off the ground, and then you give it to the city. You're like, here, look, it exists. All you have to do is keep it going. Um, and the city then takes it on. In the case of Durham, I found this little nugget again when I was researching Durham for my first book. That library did not get a budget increase until the early 1970s. It ran for almost 50 years on the same budget it had had in the late 1920s. I can't even imagine. That's crazy. I mean, it's like, you know that Jim Crow existed. My family's from the South. They had a feed store. There was a door for white people, a door for black people. You know, like they had it, but it's just the, the, the pettiness. Pity and pettiness of the system is just beyond me. I don't understand that. And I mean, the pettiness is also in many ways the point, right? Because the point is to dehumanize. Yeah. And so if we can do that in these, you know, you have to come in the front of the bus and put your money in the front and then go back out the doors and walk down the bus and then come in the back doors of the bus. And sometimes we'll drive away before you have a chance to do that. You know, like that's that the whole point of that is, you know, the whole system's built on that. But yeah, that I remember when I found that about the, the Durham library, because I had always wondered, I'd been like, okay, so these women's clubs, you know, they raise all this money and do all this work to get these things up and going. And then they give them to the city because they know they can't fund them, you know, in perpetuity. Um, and especially I'm sure any of them that they were still trying to keep afloat when the Great Depression hit, there goes that. Um, and then the city's like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it open. We'll keep the lights on, but that's about it. Yeah. Wow. So these are all things that they had asked their allies in the WCTU, in suffrage, in other things to support them with. And these are meeting really basic needs that are, are otherwise provided to white citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, library comes to mind. I, I still have to point out to my students like why libraries are meaningful because you know they have a library in their in their pocket and so they don't they don't get it right. and um and why you know why would Carnegie give out libraries <laughs> you know yeah and I think I mean and in some places outside of the south these services are being are being handled again on a more integrated basis. So places like Hull House or the Henry Street Settlement in New York, those settlement houses that especially the public health and the larger ones, some of the libraries, those are there for the neighborhood sort of writ large, whoever is in the neighborhood. And I know that there were some African Americans in the neighborhood around Hull House that could use it, you know, sort of equally. But again, you know, before the 19 teens, the number of African Americans living outside of the South is it's like. 10% of the total black population. It's not a lot of people. Um, and, and so while it's always important, this was a thing that I sort of got up on my horse about a lot when I was talking about suffrage and it became very trendy over the summer to talk about the 19th Amendment as an amendment that just enfranchised white women. And I'm like, yes, but <laughs> it's like, there are black women who live outside of the South. There are a lot more of them in 1920 than there were in 1910. And this amendment does a lot for them. And also women like Terrell is super involved in suffrage in DC. Um, and then after the 19th amendment passage, she organizes a women's Republican club in DC and becomes sort of overtly partisan. Um, Ida B. Wells uh, organizes a suffrage club in Chicago um, in the early 19 teens. Um, that then once women get the right to vote in Illinois in 1913, they um, campaign for the first black alderman in the city of Chicago, and he wins his his campaign. Um, so there's, you know, it's it's always a little bit tricky in this time period, right? Because there is the majority experience in the Jim Crow South that's really locked down, but then there it was a little bit better, a little bit better. Um, for those women. And again, by, you know, over the course of the 19 teens, we're talking about a lot more people um, because of the Great Migration. So do Black women's clubs and, and maybe women's clubs in general, do they, they fall out of fashion at some point? Or 
or am I just like blind to their existence? I mean, I mean, they do still exist. This is the other, before the suffrage thing in particular, I, I had a few invitations to go give talks to the ladies who lunch here in Auburn, uh, which was sort of this hilarious group of little white haired ladies. Um, so they do still exist. Um, and they do a lot of, a lot of them do sort of local philanthropic work now, a lot of like scholarship fundraising and that kind of thing. Um, they still, a lot of them are still, you know, basically book clubs. Um, how, especially for the white women, when they started, um, the early white women in, in them in the 1870s and 1880s, um, referred to them as college for middle-aged ladies because their daughters were the first generation of women that could really go to college in large numbers as women's colleges started to open after the civil war in larger numbers. And so they're seeing their daughters go and get this education that they could never get. And so they do, they like go to the public library and they like write papers about Chaucer and then come and stand and give it to the, to the other women sitting in the room. Um, so, uh, and, and they still do that, right? We still have book clubs. And so they still, they did both the General Federation of Women's Clubs, which is the white one, um, and the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs both still exist. Um, and, but they do definitely fall out of fashion to a certain extent. And I think they're, I think a lot of these things, because then other groups like the YWCA, which I'm obviously to loop back to the beginning of our conversation, a huge fan of, um, and like the League of Women Voters, which is what NASA becomes, um, I feel like are having more of a moment in the past five, 10 years. Um, the YWCA's dual motto since the 1970s has been eliminating racism, empowering women. That's what they do. Um, and like the, in Asheville, where I used to live, there was an amazing YWCA there that did just all sorts of great, you know, outreach and like the kind of work that we're talking about, like they had a really fantastic program, um, for, um, high school aged, uh, for high schoolers who became pregnant and, and not just like, here's a box of diapers, good luck. But it was more focused on keeping the girls in school after they'd had the babies. And so it was like mentoring circles and support groups and all of this kind of stuff for them after the kids were born and they were trying to stay in school mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. You know, the League of Women Voters is exploding right now um, in terms of membership. I've talked to a few people that are like, oh my gosh, we have like twice as many members as we did three years ago. We don't know what to do with it. Um, so I think they're, they're sort of having a moment now and we'll see if it sustains. I'm constantly, fast. there's tons of women my age who are in the junior league, including like my stepsister. I'm like, what do y'all do? Oh, you raise money for stuff and give money to, okay, that's cool. Like the junior, like the head of the junior league in Auburn, Alabama is an African-American woman, which fascinates me. And, and, you know, one of the charities that got a big check from them last year was a Girl Scout, a, a Girl Scout troop at the community center that serves the Hispanic, the Latino community here in Auburn and has a Spanish speaking Girl Scout troop. Um, and this is what the Junior League gave its money to. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so I think they've always been around. I think they definitely, they fell out of getting talked about for a few reasons, I think. Their number, the number of women doing them certainly dropped from the 1970s forward as more women went into paid employment. That's thing number one. Um, you know, when I'm talking about like the baby boom in particular, I always tell my students, okay, so if you cluster your kids very close to the beginning of your marriage and you get married when you're 21, even if you have like four kids, the youngest of them is in school by the time you're in your mid thirties, a whole lot of life left. <laughs> um, and so, um, so I think, you know, women going back to work in the seventies is one of the things that did definitely drop the numbers, but I also think there was a real because when I've given talks about my first book, I've gone to a couple of things over the years where it's, there was one thing I did where it was like, they actually pitched it. There's a group called Veteran Feminists of America. That's an organization of 1970s, 60s and 70s feminists. Um, and so it was women from that organization paired with historians my age. So I was born in 1980. So, you know, sort of historians of this younger generation. Um, and I get up there and I talk about how, you know, the why and the league were these really important channels of feminism outside of the biggest cities and blah, 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 blah. Um, and one of the other women, one of the veteran feminists, um, at one point when she's giving her remarks later in the same panel goes, and you know, it was really, it was our life. We weren't just like the League of Women Voters ladies looking for something to do. 
<laughs> and this very well-known senior scholar at Duke, which was the institution hosting the thing, comes up to me at the cocktail hour afterwards. And she's like, they still can't give those women their due. I'm like, no, because if they did, they would have to admit that they aren't as different from their mothers as they think they are. <laughs> and she just busted out laughing. And she's like, that's completely true. <laughs> So that's a lot of it is that the first generation of, like my book is the only book, it's been out for like six years now, seven years. Um, it's the only book length work that looks at the interaction between these groups and feminism. Hmm. Everything else that looks at grassroots feminism is all about, and there's not that much, um, is about now chapters or local women's liberation groups or like explicitly newly formed overt feminist stuff. And, you know, part of why I got into the first project to begin with was I was like reading these books that kept being about the same 500 women in New York. I'm like, yeah, but those women didn't convince my father who drove a train for CSX for 35 years and grew up on a dirt road in Northeastern Kentucky. Those women did not convince my father of a thing. Mm -hmm. And yet he told me I could be whatever I wanted. And he let me tag along after him to the hardware store and, you know, lay in the floor and watch woodworking shows on PBS every Sunday afternoon, right? Like he he got the message that he was supposed to get as a father of a daughter in the 80s. So how did that happen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so anyway, we have gone far afield from where we were supposed to be. But, no, but I think that's such an important, an important piece because it's part of this. Yeah, like the networks are more interconnected than we realize. And yes. there's there's a lot to that. Yeah. And there's um, always, the networks are always more interconnected. Like it's, if you, if you scratch a little bit at any one of these groups, you're going to find that the women are in six other groups. Right. So like another group that was really big in the mid 20th century is a group called Church Women United. That's mm. like an ecumenical Protestant organization or um, multi-denominational Protestant organization. Mm -hmm. And they've got Black women, white women, every church in town. They've got League of Women Voters, YWCA ladies, and they're all still coming and sitting in the in the Church Women United thing. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite finds in Indianapolis was in the 70s when the 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 uh, president of the Church Women United's column in the newsletter was called the Editor's Needlepoint. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, these are church ladies. Um, yeah, she's soliciting volunteers for the rape crisis hotline that they're starting <laughs> in Indy in the mid 70s. I'm like, yes. That's awesome. It's all interconnected. It's never as separate as we make it seem. And, and I think it, and the feminism is never as separate, right? Like feminism sort of gets talked about as this thing that's over here and only lives in this handful of overtly, explicitly feminist groups. Mm -hmm. And that's just not how, that's not how real life works. That's not how people work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, when you were talking about the different things that the clubs were doing, it reminded me of, I, God, I don't know where I read this, but it was talk, uh, I read something about the Black Panthers and how the Black Panthers were really doing a lot of this like community building mm -hmm. and they weren't as like radical, you know, gun. They are radical, but they're not as militant. And militant maybe as people, as people make them out to be. Right. Is, the our movements like that in the 70s a continuation of the work that these clubs are doing are they rising up because clubs are going away or is there any connection I, mean, I think that there's so for certainly for if we're looking at civil rights groups and if we're looking in the south i think the through line is definitely the church right um even for the you know even for the younger snick activists um who aren't coming from that overtly, you know, that overtly Christian place, but they're all, the SNCC activists are all coming out of HBCUs, which as they were the first ones to point out in the sixties are still very much doing politics of respectability, mm -hmm. you know, very much curfews for the women's students. You've got to wear a skirt. The guys have to wear a tie, like very much that politics of respectability thing is still a central, a central piece of, um, you know, Stokely Carmichael had some great quotes about this that he got to when he got to Howard, um, that Howard was so much less radical than he expected it to be, basically, that, you know, this place that gave, you know, where Thurgood Marshall taught um, is, is like, has all these in the early 60s really strict rules about like what students can and cannot say on campus and where they can go and what they can do. Um, so I think there's, I think both, 
if we're looking in the South, those are the sort of through lines. And I'm also thinking about somebody like Julian Bond, who's, you know, one of the founders of SNCC. Um, his grandfather was, uh, was a college professor at Berea College in Kentucky, which is this college that's founded to, to teach Appalachian kids. And, um, and it's founded in the late 1860s. So to free, to uh, educate newly freed men and women and Appalachian kids together in the 1860s in central Kentucky. Um, and Julian's grandfather was on the faculty there. Right, so he's from this very, again, very middle class politics of respectability family. So I think I think the black church and then the the sort of general political, you know, ethos. And even if you think about some of the early, you know, again, sort of leaving aside King and and SCLC, the sort of explicitly the Southern Christian Leadership Coalition. These are all the ministers leading. Even leaving that aside, you know, if you think about SNCC's early actives and think about something like the sit-ins. You know, this is what I always talk to my students about. It's like, get your mental image of not the crowd that's yelling and dumping ketchup on their heads, but the young people sitting at that counter, right? The women are in dresses and gloves. The men are in ties. Like there's that, that politics of respectability through line is very present in the early years of the civil rights movement. And then I think like with the Black Panthers, it's more with them, it's more just about nothing's getting better, right? Like, and there's a um, there's a book called American Babylon by uh, Robert Self that's about Oakland. It's just about the East Bay, um, but sort of started from the observation that um, uh, the Black Panthers and the sort of Reagan era tax revolt came from the same place. Like they both start in the East Bay. And so it's like, hmm, let's look into that. Um, and it's just that like, that things like the industrialization and segregation and discrimination are really wreaking havoc on the black population in Oakland, even though there's no Jim Crow laws on the books. Hmm. And so that's why something like the Black Panthers focuses on this sort of radical, you know, socialist critique of the state, but also knows that it's really important to feed people. Hmm. Um, and so they start their breakfast program. She's talking about the politics of respectability. And I had heard that um, you know, this idea that black women need to act a certain way and dress as upper class as they can and um, act, you know, the, their best at all times in order to sort of like prove something. Um, I had heard that in the process, it was kind of like this rich black group that was sort of condescending to other black people. And That's not good. Yeah. And I... So I, I kind of, I wanted to know a little bit more about that and whether she perceived it that way. Um, so this is what she said. Sure. So it is, I mean, it, it does have some of that going on. Um, as really all progressive era, you know, sort of late 19th, early 20th century women's activism did. These are all middle class women who think that they, that want to help, right? That want to, that see the problems that, working class people sort of regardless of race are dealing with and want to help, very few of them actually go and ask those working class people what would be helpful. Um, and, and so that's absolutely true. Politics, of and that's true across the board, politics of respectability specifically has gotten sort of, gotten sort of a bad rap for lack of a better word. I don't love that, but you get what I mean. Um, because it's also seen as really putting very, very strict roles on black women's bodies and their sexuality. That like, you have to be totally buttoned up and you know, there you go. Um, and so like, again, I mentioned Tara Hunter's book uh, To Join My Freedom earlier. Um, she's, it's a book about Atlanta from 1860s through the turn of the 20th century. And there are these, there's this, there's a place called Decatur Street that's like, not exactly the red light district, but it's where sort of the dive bars are. And there's early blues dance clubs that are called juke joints. And the working class black women go there all the time and dance dances with names like the funky butt and both their white employers, as you would expect, but also a lot of the sort of politics of respectability, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, black women lose their minds. Mm. right? Because to the middle-class Black women, they're like, this is fulfilling every stereotype that they have had about us since 
before slavery. Like if you go back and read, you know, 15th century European, you know, explorer narratives of Africa, they're talking about how sexual black women are. And so they're like, we have to stop. No, we can't play into this. And the, the working class women counter by saying, this is a space where I can use my body in the way that I want, not the way somebody else is telling me to, like they do all day when I'm at work, where I can articulate my own version of femininity, my own vision of womanhood, um, where I can show off the parts of my body I'm proud of, you know, and they really get at loggerheads. The other thing, and I didn't, I'm going to sort of put in this plug. Um, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to get too much into the weeds of this for the audience that you were sort of pitching to, but there's a, another great book that I'm going to sort of, even though no one's going to see it, but I think you'll appreciate the cover called Be, oops, called Beyond Respectability mm. by Brittany Cooper. Mm. Um, so Brittany Cooper is also a very, she's a very, very prominent black intellectual. She's on Twitter a lot. Um, she was one of the founders of the Crunk Feminist Collective um, back in the, in the 90s um, through the, into the 2000s. Um, and so, and her, and so it's called Beyond Respectability, and she really digs in, the subtitle is The Intellectual Thought of Race Women, and she really digs into Terrell, and especially Anna Julia Cooper, who's the, who's another one that's a close ally of Terrell's, um, and who has the sort of famous line, Paula Giddings used it to title one of her books, um, that where Cooper says, only a Black woman may say, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me basically saying, if we make things better for Black women, we make things better for everybody. Um, and, and so Cooper is really digging in more to the, you know, her introduction is this amazing, amazing takedown of like, you know, we got bookshelves full of books about W.E.B. Du Bois. We got one book about Anna Julia Cooper and everybody acts like we can't have another one. <laughs> Like, why not? Yeah. Um, so um, it's like the, the intellectual conversation around sort of politics of respectability, the academic conversation around it is, is evolving and rich and really buzzing right now. Mm -hmm. um, but because there is that, like what you said at the beginning was sort of the default position around it five, 10 years ago of like, but now people like Cooper have been like, or people like, yeah, like Cooper, um, I've been like, but wait, let's see what they're actually trying to do with this. Her, her whole point is we've cherry picked these quotes from these women and not actually dug into the substance of really reading everything they're saying and trying to understand how this fits into what we know from their actions was a very sort of multivalent approach to trying to fix women's lives. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just feel so grateful to have been able to talk to Melissa Blair about this topic. Yeah. I learned so much from her and, um, I, I now like have an epic reading list <laughs> that I have to, <laughs> have to go address. Um, so, you know, this was, um, just a really great experience, but it, it left me with a lot of questions and, I think the origin of these black women's clubs and the mm -hmm. fact that they come about because people are, because they're being excluded, because they're being um, condescended to by yep. white women um, and, and left out of, of white women's clubs and temperance, you know, I just, that I think will tell students a lot about the black women's experience. You know, these are... Yeah motivated, intelligent, wonderful black women who want to do something and, and improve society and they can't because they're black, you know, like it's so ridiculous. And so, um, and I think that will tell the kids a little bit about why, you know, just why these, or getting into the question of why w black women's clubs started, I think will help kids understand the racism. Um, yeah. So we have and, an, and I think understanding at that period in time, that there was a voice there and that's their narrative and um because they don't come in as often as we want them to throughout the stories that we already currently have so why not give a perspective that you don't already have exactly exactly so um we have an inquiry up about that and then i've also made an inquiry 
for teachers to utilize that asks the question about whether suffragists were racist. And um, oh. and I think both of those would go really well with what I've learned to, um, from Melissa Blair and I just think would be really beneficial um, additions to a typical history class and would fit into the unit on Reconstruction. It would fit into the unit on women's suffrage. Um, either Either place would be really really perfect awesome thanks brooke thank you so much for learning with me tonight <laughs> yeah thank you i'm i'm beyond excited to listen to to more from melissa and and read some of her stories which is great so um i'm brooke sullivan i'm kelsey eckert see you next time <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.